and tell you on this series this morning, I'm actually going to ask Jenny, go into my office and grab my, never mind. Here we go. Technology is wonderful when it works. There we go. Starting a new series this morning called the, the Call of Christmas. And the first part of the message here is an open salvation message. And if you're here today and you do not know the Lord as your Savior, I will at the end of this service, I'm preparing your heart now, I will be giving an altar call asking you to come and to make sure that you know that you are right with God. It's one thing to know about God. It's another thing to have a personal relationship with them. The last week I talked about, you know, why in the world Jesus came. We went through many aspects of that. And one of the aspects of that was the, to destroy and to put religion in its place. And Jesus did that. When I'm talking about faith in Christ, I'm not talking about having a religion. I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm talking about giving your life to Jesus. Following him as your Lord and Savior. The call to prepare. When Zachariah, the aging priest in the video that we just watched, went to work that day, he did not expect an encounter with an angel. He thought it would be just like the regular occurrence that he had as other ones have. But this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for these men of God. He had been a priest for decades and has served faithfully in his priestly responsibilities for as long as he can remember. However, God regularly, regularly works through ordinary people doing what they normally do in their lives. He and Elizabeth were old and barren. They wanted the child but could not have one. In those days to be childless was a sign that something intensely, something seriously was wrong in your life, with your life. Some would even go as far as to say that the, the hand of God is against you. To be childless meant that you have no hope for the future. The first Advent candle that we lit this morning speaks of hope. The whole Christmas message has different aspects, but one of the main aspects it has, the main thing it has, is that it gives us hope. See, the world is looking for that today. If you look at the news, you watch the news, if you follow headlines, you look at the situation in the world we live in, the world is without hope. There are people... They are taking their lives. There are people that are turning to alcohol and drugs and all other manner of, of vices and releases just to find a moment of hope, a moment of peace. But the Christmas message, the coming of Jesus, brings us hope. As I said, the first Advent candle speaks of hope in so many ways. Hope for the world in the coming of a Savior. Hope for the world because God had broken his 400 years of silence. Hope for this couple because they would finally have a child of their own. Hope because God was preparing the way for this couple, through this couple, through their child, that uh, they would have to make a way for the coming of Christ into this world. This takes us to the message of the one preparing a way. There's an important principle that we must learn from the story of John. Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, who was brought into this world to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of God into this world. As we say in the Bible says, Emmanuel, God with us. John. The Baptist, even though the Bible seems to have little to say about John, he conveys to us a simple but important message that still applies today about the repentance of sin. He went around with one message, and that was the repentance of sin. In other words, turning from sin, turning to God. Every single person in this auditorium today, every single person in Blenheim, every single person in Canada, every single person on this planet has sinned, is a sinner. 
And Jesus came to redeem us, to rescue us from our sin. So how did John the Baptist prepare the way? We are clearly told that John was sent to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. But what exactly did he do in preparing that way? We are told in Luke chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, that he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. That word remission actually means the removal of. Has anyone ever had cancer surgery or some type of surgery to remove some type of cancer, tumor, or growth in your physical body? Anyone? The purpose of that surgery is to remove that alien, foreign object from your body so that it will not grow and it will not destroy your lives, your life. Jesus came to remove sin and the consequence and the penalty of sin from our lives. That word remission speaks of that. The Bible tells us that from the words of the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Also in Matthew chapter 3, in those days, came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was when Jesus came to this world. So how did the people cooperate with John? How did John cooperate with God in preparing the way for Jesus? They confessed their sins and were baptized as a sign that they have turned from their sins. Matthew 3, 6 tells us, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, speaking of John the Baptist, confessing their sins. So what does it mean to prepare the way? It means to create a favorable environment or to make it easy for one to come to you and operate in your life. How many have the Christmas tree up? We don't yet. We're going to be working on that very soon. And so why do we put the Christmas tree up? Why do we have all these beautiful decorations on the platform? Because we want to create an atmosphere of Christmas. We do things in our home to create an atmosphere of welcoming people into our home. We want in this church to create an atmosphere that every single person feels welcome. Doesn't it just make your heart excited when you walk in and see all the lights and might have to put sunglasses on it sometime. But to see all the lights, and doesn't it just make your heart warm? It does. You see the Christmas trees and the balls and the different decorations because it creates an atmosphere. We do the same at home. We light candles. We have scented candles because we want to create an atmosphere. Preparing the way for God, preparing the way for Jesus means to make a favorable environment or to make it easy for one to come to you and to operate in your life. If we look at Luke chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, it says, As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make its path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain, will, uh, every mountain and every hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Now, there's more to this verse than we have time to deal with this morning that we have allowed to deal with. This morning, we're dealing with only one part of this time frame. Zechariah and his son, who would be born to prepare to make room for Jesus. Apparently, John the Baptist was creating a favorable environment, making it easy for Jesus to enter into the world and operate in the lives of people. The same is true on the opposite side of the coin. Notice how John the Baptist, in preparing the way for the Lord, 
Jesus to come through the preaching of repentance and baptism for the remission of sins or the removal of sins. He created a favorable environment for Jesus to enter and operate in the lives of people. Jesus wants to be a part of your life. He came to this world not just to start a carpentry shop, not just to start the church, but to become a part of your life. You may not understand this. I've been preaching for many years. I still don't fully understand this. But he saw us as he looked down the hallway, the corridor of time. He saw us and knew he went and came to this world and died on the cross, which we're going to be celebrating in just a few moments after this message in communion, because he knew you needed a Savior. He knew that you needed hope. Again, he's not talking about being religious. He's not talking about joining an organization or a group. But recognizing why God created you in the first place. And God created you in the first place. You were born on this earth that you may have communion and fellowship and a relationship with your heavenly father. But on the other side of the coin, we see the same principle is true as it also is today in many people's lives, as it was in John the Baptist's day, that many people are involved in deep sins in order to gain spiritual guides, uh, etc. When people get involved in heavy Satanism and, and they have the fascination for the occult and the afterlife and so on and so on. They had the same fascination back then. Hollywood can't calls in and all that. They cash in on that. How they committed gross sexual sins. It almost sounds when you read what was going on during the time of, of John's birth and Jesus' birth, it almost sounds like we're taking a page out of our own newspaper today. Does that not speak of the, what we're seeing around the world today? Such sins defy defiles a person and creates a favorable environment for the devil to dwell and operate. Sins prepare the way for the devil and his demons, while repentance and remission of sins prepares the way for the Lord. So how does this apply to us today? And I believe the Lord gives us a revelation about how we can prepare the way for the Lord in our own lives. John the Baptist was said to be sent forth to prepare the way for Jesus. But what exactly did he do? He preached the repentance of sins, the baptize of people for the remission of the sins. He was getting people ready for Jesus' arrival by getting them to turn from their sin and repent. There was a point in my life. At the age of 17, when I realized that I was not going to heaven. That because of, and I wasn't a, a horrible, I wasn't a murderer. I wasn't a rapist. I wasn't an extortioner. I, I, I didn't do all kinds of manner of, of evil that was out there in the world today. But I was still a sinner that was lost. And there was a point in my time, in my life, where I had recognized that I needed Jesus to be a part of my life. Because I did not have hope. I did not have peace. I did not know where I was going to spend eternity. I had no clue. I didn't know if there was a heaven or there was a hell. I had no clue. When I found out, I realized I need Jesus in my life. He preached repentance. I believe a valuable principle we can learn from today's story that if we are, if there are unconfessed sins in our lives, they will hinder us from seeing the Lord. We need to repent of our sins and turn from them and receive forgiveness. I love what 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says. If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And some people may think, well, I'm a pretty good person. My mother, before she came to know the Lord, she had that same thing. She attended church years before. 
She thought she was a good person. She was a faithful wife. She was a faithful mother. She was faithful in a lot of different things. She didn't kill anybody, although her son, there were times she was tempted to do. And she thought she was going to heaven. She thought everything was just fine. We attended this crusade back in 1980, I believe it was, where she realized that she was not going to heaven. She gave her life to Jesus. And shortly after that, I saw the change in her, and I recognized my need as well, and I gave my life to Jesus. Because I needed him in my life. I'll be honest, I don't know where my life would be today if I had not made that decision. First John tells us that, to confess a sin. But they are washed and cleansed because Jesus died on the cross. For they were moved as far as the east is from the west. If we fail to acknowledge our sins, however, Proverbs 28, 13 tells us we will not prosper. So the thing is, okay, I acknowledge my sin. And you really don't need to tell a whole lot of people that you have sinned. Because a lot of people know the Bible in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, all of us have messed up. We know that we've done wrong. We know that we sinned. But simply acknowledging our sin is not good enough. Simply acknowledging that we are a sinner is not good. As John clearly rebukes the Pharisees for not living up to the confession in Matthew chapter 3. <laughs> and John the Baptist was one of these guys that shot from the hip. You do not need to wonder or worry where you stood with John the Baptist. I mean, if, if he had beef with you, you knew it. So these are the words he says. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be baptized, he denounced them, you brood of snakes. Isn't that encouraging? He exclaimed, who warned you to flee from God's judgment, coming judgment? Prove by the way you live that you have really turned from your sin and turned to God. I love what Proverbs 28, 13 says. Also makes it clear that, that we are to turn from our sins, that he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whosoever confesses his sins and forsakes them shall have mercy. Today is a very clear cut, very simple message. The call to prepare our hearts, and our lives. I prepared my heart early January 1981 when I gave my heart to the Lord. I prepared a pathway for him to come into my life and be my Lord. The Bible doesn't necessarily have a lot to say about John. But we do know this, that he was sent forth to repair the way. And he did that by preaching the repentance and remission or removal of the people's sins. And I believe that by confessing and turning from one's sin, we can prepare the way for the Lord to move and operate in our lives as well. I remember sitting in our kitchen at 13 Grafton Avenue Street in Hamilton, Ontario. If you do not know where that is, the house is no longer there. It was torn down. Beach Boulevard becomes Eastport Drive right off of there. The QEW Highway, I could throw a stone at it. I remember sitting in that kitchen, a kitchen chair at the table, when I received Jesus Christ to come into my life, to be a part of my life, and I would follow him. I prepared my life at that moment for God to do a wonderful work in my life, and I've never regretted it. So when we think of preparation, I'm going to be closing off with this. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. So the song we're going to sing called... Um, Forget the name of the song. Wonderful name, I think it's called. So man, I'll get a man to them to come. Beautiful name, that works. So wonderful name. As we prepare our homes, and we go to great lengths to prepare our homes, I don't even know how many hours were in preparation to prepare this platform, this auditorium, and this building for Christmas. More than I would want for, did not tell you. 
But as we prepare our homes, prepare our church, prepare our communities, our workplaces for Christmas. How many have done their Christmas shopping yet? You're done? People like me do not like people like you. <laughs> How many have not started? Okay, see, you're, you're okay, we, we got to stick together. We invest time preparing our hearts for the advent of the king. To celebrate Jesus coming to this world. He came as a rescue mission to rescue us from our sin. Plain and simple. How do we respond to the call to prepare during this Christmas season? In order to prepare, we must make room for him in our lives. It's not good enough just to simply acknowledge who he is. Yes, he's a great teacher. Yes, he was God's son. Yes, he was this. Yes, he was that. We have to make room for him. To create a margin in my life for God to work and to speak to my life. I did that at the age of 17. In our heart to think about the big questions, but we start with the end in mind and work backwards. And that means we ask these three questions. What do I want God to say when I stand before him? What do I want God to say when I stand before him? Number two, what do I want said about me at my funeral? What do I want said about me at my funeral? Because you know what the good news is? Every one of us will die. Unless Jesus comes before that. And what will make me feel like, third question, what will make me feel like I've lived my life well? What will make me feel like I lived my life well? Let me give you my answer for those three questions. And you have to answer these three questions on your own. What do I want God to say when I stand before him? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of the Lord. Welcome home. Secondly, what do I want said about me at my funeral is what they said about David. In the Old Testament, a man after God's own heart. That I sought God, that I followed God. What will make me feel like I lived my life well? Is that people came to know Jesus and wanted to share in the same relationship that I have with God by what they saw. Not that I am perfect, not that I have all the answers, but that people would see something in me that they would want to know God more. So I say this in closing. Where are you today? Where are you in a relationship with God? But many people in here, you know Jesus as your Savior. You know him. You've given your life to him. But I do know there's probably one or two, maybe more, that have never made a commitment. Or you're not where you should be with God. And maybe you've been in and out, in and out. Today is the day that I want to challenge you. I'm going to get to do something completely radical, something that, you, that will take nerve. I want you to choose today to prepare your heart, to prepare your life for God to do a, an awesome work in your life. I cannot make that choice for you. You have to. I can tell you all about how good he is. We can sing that how much he loves us. But you have to choose. Just at the early age of 17, I had to choose. Yes, I want to follow Jesus. You have to choose. I want to follow Jesus. You may not fully understand everything that we're talking about. That's okay. Neither did I. But when I gave my life to Jesus, I grew and I understood more. 
I learn more about God. And the more I learn about God, the more I've come to love Him, the more I've come to appreciate what He's done. So this morning, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask, if you are not right with God today, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, if you are not a, a believer, if you are not 100% sure that you are going to heaven, I'm going to get us all to stand first. If you're not 100% sure, I mean, you can bet your life on it because you are. And you say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. I'm going to invite you as we sing this song to step out of your seat and join me right here.